on a gentle slope, a lone bristlecone pine tree beneath a starry night sky. In the heart of the west, a vast landscape awaits the dawn. Over a craggy ridge, a bright blue sky. The warming sun reveals high peaks and broad valleys. A mountainous landscape dotted with trees. Stretching, it seems, to infinity. In sagebrush, deer stand. Air pungent with sagebrush and pines. A steep rocky slope, hikers descend in single file. An enormous place, rich with the intricate gifts of nature. On a yellow flower, a butterfly claims. On a large rock, a bighorn sheep stands and surveys the surroundings. A mountainous slope blanketed with snow. Over dark green leaves, water pours. On a spindly branch, a dragonfly perches. An ancient landscape. Down a mountain slope, a herd of elk gallop. Still living. Over a wide valley, sunlight streaks through clouds. Like nowhere else, the Great Basin spans a singular continuum of time and space. A rugged landscape against the background of the vast Great Basin, surrounded by mountain ranges in white lettering, words read, under a desert sky, life in the Great Basin. A highway. There are certain emotions and feelings that it's almost like they dwell here and I have to come back to them here. When I drive into this country, tears come. Along the highway, a man drives accompanied by a woman. It's a strange thing about the Great Basin that as vast as it is, as far as you can see, as dramatic as parts of it are, it doesn't feel as though you're diminished. It feels as though you are in a natural world where you belong. Horses. Across the valley, a man in blue jeans, a shirt, sunglasses, and a white Stetson rides a chestnut-colored horse behind a herd of cattle. I think that this is farther from a big city, farther from an interstate, than almost anywhere in the country. Across the valley, flanked by snow-dusted mountains, cattle graze. Inside a cave, a woman in helmet with headlights. To me, caves hold a really special place, and they have um, a different feeling than just being on the surface. It's almost like walking into a church. Outside, by a pond, a woman sits and watches children in the water. My family can trace back to my great-great-grandfather. Our family has lived here forever. A black and white photograph of Native Americans in front of simple shelters. Over a wide valley, a cloudy sky. The Great Basin stretches from Utah's Wasatch Mountains to the Sierra Nevada in California, in one endless reach of mountain ranges and wide valleys. Mountainous slopes carpeted with snow. At the center of this immense region, in the South Snake Range, Great Basin National Park protects the jewels of this country. Some of its highest mountains, its most spectacular caves, and some of the oldest trees on Earth. Trees laden with snow, through a forest, a couple of hikers stroll. This dramatic landscape holds special meaning for those who visit and return again and again. The Great Basin is a place of great space. You can see for long distances. It's a place that has very little human development in it of a large scale. The Great Basin is a place where the natural world is the primary world. Caption, Becky Mills and Dave Sharp, park visitors. I know. Beautiful. There's an ability to listen to natural sounds that is rare. Becky and Dave cross a stream. Becky glances up. You can hear the wings of a bird fly overhead. A bird of prey soars. You can hear the sound of the wind in the trees. A bristlecone pine, its branches gently swaying. It's really the basic connection to life, to water, to air, to earth. Sitting on a rock, Becky paints the landscape. Using watercolor, she paints the tree trunk of a bristlecone pine. The Great Basin is a dry land where hardy desert plants often endure months without rain. Across a valley floor, dry cracked mud. The arid heat of summer is broken by violent thunderstorms. A dark sky. Dropping much needed moisture to the parched earth below. From a blanket of clouds, sheets of rain fall to the ground. The sky darkens, a streak of lightning flashes toward the earth. 
Wispy clouds pass, a starry night sky. Bare tree branches protrude into the darkness. Daylight, over a wide open plain, a smattering of clouds across a deep blue sky. Water streams over greenery into a pool. Water also wells up in rare springs across the Great Basin. A black and white photograph of a man on a lake on a small raft. The Shoshone, one of the region's first peoples, have always cherished this precious gift. Alongside a long stretch of translucent water, a woman strides over grass. Caption, Virginia Sanchez, Duckwater Shoshone Chairman. In the Shoshone spiritual beliefs and culture, earth, water, and air are intertwined, and water is sacred. But particularly this spring... Water flows over rocks into a pool. The water has a spirit, and we're taught to give acknowledgement and thanks for the life that it brings. Without it, we wouldn't be alive. Alongside water, tall reeds grow. In the past, the tulies were used as food. The fibers were used for mats, clothing, and houses. The birds were eaten. The Railroad Valley spring fish that my mother calls Nisha Bangui. There were so many of them that they would be caught and roasted in winnowing trays with coals and eaten. The game that comes around the water, it's an essential part of life. Across a pond, geese swim. Steep rocky slopes and sharp peaks. Incomers to the region sought a different form of riches. The mountains of the Great Basin were veined with metals that fired the imaginations of many. In a forest clearing, derelict log cabins. White pine fever lured thousands of miners into these eastern Nevada hills in the 19th century. Black and white photographs. In 1877, the Snake Range gave up its secret. Large deposits of gold and silver were found here. At the mouth of a cave, a man stands. On a railroad track, three men pose holding onto a small wooden wagon. These mining rushes, and others like them, created many of the towns that exist in the Great Basin today. Photographs of a settlement and of a one-story log cabin in front of which a family poses. Miners' cabins, and perhaps their dreams, are still preserved in the dry mountain air. On a rocky slope, a small wooden cabin in disrepair. A forest. Though the slopes of the park are no longer cut by the miner's pick, they continue to be carved as they have been for millennia by snowmelt. Through a forest, a stream meanders. The moving water erodes the limestone, creating arches above ground. A limestone arch. And caves beneath. Inside a cave, stalactites stretch down from the ceiling. Two people scramble on hands and knees. Lamps from hard hats cast pale yellow light. Caption, Jean Kretschka, cave biologist. The work that I do is biospeleology, which is cave biology, the study of life in caves. I really got interested in exploring caves because of the element of unknown that caves have to them. In order to find out if this small, tight little cave passage opens up into a beautiful room or maybe just pinches down into nothing, the only way to know that is to actually go there. Through the cave, the explorers crawl on their stomachs. There's some really nice lactites up here. Still actively growing, too, a lot of drifts. On the tip of a stalactite, a small droplet of water hangs. These caves are formed from rainwater that falls from the sky. It takes on a little bit of carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere. It becomes weak carbonic acid. And then that finds little joints and cracks in the limestone, and it has this chemical reaction where it dissolves. And it slowly enlarges these joints to make linear passages. Through the cave, cavers with lights on their hard hats explore. A valley bottom braided with streams. The Great Basin is simply that, a giant area in which rivers drain not to an ocean, but into the ground or into lakes. Much of this arid expanse was once the prehistoric Lake Bonneville. Only a few signs of it remain, including a remarkable fish. Through a forest, a stream rushes. The Bonneville cutthroat trout hung on in isolated mountain streams after Lake Bonneville receded 15,000 years ago. Thought to be locally extinct by the 1930s, 
it was rediscovered in a remote area of Great Basin National Park. Caption, Mark Pepper, NPS fish biologist. Lately, we've been doing population estimates to find out where there's low densities and high densities to see where we can move fish around. Just trying to get the numbers back where they were before non-native species were introduced and their numbers were reduced back in the past. A fish is placed in a bucket. And then we're moving the fish from high density areas to vacant areas. The fish is released. With this help from the National Park Service, the Bonneville, once at the brink of extinction, now re-inhabit many of the streams in the park. They are thriving on their own, with a secure claim on their rightful habitat. In a stream, the Bonneville cutthroat trout swim. The waters of the Bonneville's home streams also sustain livelihoods in this land of little rain. Across a grassy plain behind a herd of cattle, a rancher rides on horseback. Our ranch is a cow-calf operation. My brothers and my father and I, we work the ranch kind of as a team. And we also farm quite a bit. We raise alfalfa hay and corn and some barley. Caption, Dave Baker, rancher. Growing up here was a lot of fun. We had a great deal of freedom. We learned to drive at a young age, tractors, trucks, ride horses. And we could do what we wanted, go where we wanted, and enjoy the country. This land here is our winter range. It's public land. We have grazing permits on it. The rangeland is our livelihood. And in order to keep the rangeland from being overgrazed, you need to monitor it carefully and move the cattle and kind of keep them moving and not graze the same plants again and again. Over the scrubby rangelands, a small yellow airplane flies. In the cockpit, Dave scans the area. I've been flying since I was 16. In the winter time, it's 70 miles from your north cow to your south cow, so it's a great way to keep track of things, as well as a great deal of fun. On the rangeland, a herd of cattle graze. Farming and ranching isn't an easy living. It's kind of a low profit proposition. Margins are tight, and that is good because it gives you purpose, and that's good for a person. A mountain range stretches beyond the basin. Snow-covered peaks jut into a bright blue sky. A slope covered with trees. Orange, yellow, and green leaves are bathed in pale sunshine. As the cool winds of autumn descend on the Great Basin, brilliant fall colors appear in the upper reaches of the park and slowly cascade downhill. Aspen trees with their dainty pale orange leaves stretch toward a deep blue sky. Pale silver tree trunks with spindly branches curving skyward. Delicate golden leaves flutter gently in the breeze, their autumnal shade illuminated in faded sunshine. A rocky mountain slope, shadows loom from peaks and speckle the pale gray uneven surfaces. Below the rock covering the hillside, green conifers and orange-leaved aspen trees. Steep slopes and narrow ridges partly hidden beneath snow. Snow comes early to the mountains of the Great Basin, Winter's light paints the terrain with spectacular colors and textures. Across sheer slopes, shadows loom in pale sunshine. The rocky ridges are mottled with white snowflakes. A forested slope shrouded in dense mist. And winter's grasp can reach far into spring in the heights of the park. An evergreen forest, tree branches laden with snow. These deep snows store most of the water that reaches this arid land. Across a stream, a tree branch stretches. Icicles reach down toward the water. As those snows finally melt, they feed springs and mountain streams that carry water down to the valley below. Through a forest, a stream cascades. These waters sustain life at every elevation. Chipmunks and Clark's nutcrackers feed from a limber pine. On a pine tree branch, a gray bird perches. A yellow street sign reads, Marmot Crossing, Slow. Marmots den and raise their young on rocky hillsides. Among the rocks, a couple of brown baby marmots tussle. Alongside a forest, dark brown elk stand. Elk browse where forest meets meadow. Across grass, a couple of young foxes cavort and young kit foxes play on the desert floor. Across a meadow, a smattering of yellow wildflowers among clumps of grass. In spring and summer, 
wildflowers tap moist soils to cast vivid bursts of color onto the slopes of the park. A bright yellow flower growing among greenery, small crimson-colored flowers. Around the red petals of a wildflower, a bumblebee hovers. A conical-shaped flower, its petals a mottled pink and cream color. Delicate white flowers with yellow centers. The petals of lilac and white flowers quiver gently in the breeze. A craggy mountain range dusted with snow. Near the very peaks of these mountains, where other plants and animals fall away, tenacious trees cling to the rock and to life. A mountain range streaked with snowy crevices. Across the uneven snowy ground, trees grow intermittently. From the tip of a pine tree branch, a sap-laden cone hangs. Becky and Dave take careful slow steps as they negotiate the uneven terrain. Across a rocky surface, bristlecone pine trees grow. Bristlecones live so long, as long as 5,000 years. So if you are in the presence of them and you look around, you can see a very small one it may be as young as 50 years old. And yet, at the same time, you see dead ones who we know could be as old as 7,000 years. And you're thinking, he was young 7,000 years ago. And this one may live for 5,000 years and stand in its dead shape with its extraordinary fingers reaching to the sky for another 2,000 years. So it makes you recognize that we are only one part of an enormous cosmos that is extraordinary and mysterious. A dead bristlecone pine tree and the Milky Way. The ranger gestures toward a telescope. A teenage boy peers through the eyepiece. And then at night, if you look up, you're looking at light years of light, back and back and back in time. So you certainly become aware of the universe, the planet, and the very small space of time in which you have to live and appreciate life. Above broad valleys and high peaks, a bright blue sky smeared with clouds. This land is so vast that species have become isolated here over thousands of years. Some, like the magnificent Great Basin Rattlesnake, exist nowhere else. Over rock, a rattlesnake slithers. Others are even more localized. The peaks of the Snake Range are the only place where Holmgren's buckwheat can be found on Earth. Climate change poses new challenges to this hardy plant. As warmer temperatures move up the mountains, unique plants and animals, precarious in their alpine niches, become threatened. Species like Holmgren's buckwheat could be pushed over the edge into extinction. The tiny, delicate pink flowers of Holmgren's buckwheat. Inside a cave, Gene and another caver. Deep beneath these mountain peaks, another fragile ecosystem is still new to science. The type of study that we do is just to answer the question, what species are here? Gene lifts rocks. I spend a lot of time crawling around on my hands and knees and flipping over rocks, and really hunting, looking for critters, getting down on their level. And so it makes the study of cave science really exciting the chance that you could flip over a rock and find a new species. The pseudoscorpion is a major predator in the cave ecosystem. It's like a lion in the savanna. A tiny pseudoscorpion is photographed. One of the neat things about pseudoscorpions is that they use these big pinchers to catch their prey. And when they bring them towards their mouth, they also have venom glands in their mouth parts. And so that's how they can actually subdue their prey before they eat it. In cave science, it's all still wide open. It's all still brand new. So you really have that feeling of exploration. It's really important to set some lands like this aside. There's an ecosystem here that's unique, very fragile. And the impact even from just a roadway development or groundwater drawdown can be major and could really threaten species that occur here and nowhere else. From the mouth of a cave, Gene and a colleague emerge into the sunshine. Above a forest, the sun rises in a deep blue sky. I know some people feel that in the Great Basin, there's a timelessness. Over forests, fast-moving clouds pass. Perhaps they mean there's no need to watch the clock. There's no sense of urgency. Above snowy peaks, gray clouds gather. I think of it differently. I think of it as a flowing of time, where you become aware that the Earth changes dramatically but slowly. 
The earth erodes. The glacier that's up at Wheeler Peak is diminishing. Sheer rock faces and snow-covered slopes. It's not as if time isn't here. It's just that it's geologic time. It's natural time. Over a silty pond bottom, transparent water ripples. Children wander around the perimeter of a pond. Virginia stands nearby, looking over the grassy plain. The Duckwater Shoshone have ensured their future with the honoring of an ancient promise. The children leap into the pool. The Duckwater Shoshone tribe began restoration of the big warm spring. It had been designed for irrigation. The sides were sloughing in, and we worked with Fish and Wildlife and many other federal and state agencies to restore the spring. Restoration means caring for the spring, making sure that it has a future. Alongside the water, tall reeds grow. When the Shoshone people were created and put within this bioregion, all elements of the natural world around us spoke to us and basically told us, you take care of us, we'll take care of you. And if you do this, you will continue as a people and you will be strong. At a corral, ranchers on horseback among a herd of cattle. A young boy swings a rope above his head. The ranchers of the Snake Valley are also keeping their traditions alive. Most of these people are volunteers, you know, neighbors helping neighbors, and they want to teach their kids to rope. And wrestle a calf and teach them a good work ethic. Good job there. That's it, keep your hand in the back. Get them to bit. feel like they're part of a team and work with other people and they get a great deal of self-satisfaction out of it. Roping and the horse skills and calf wrestling is all pretty traditional. They go back a long ways. Over an irrigated field, water is sprayed. Standing on grass, three tall gray cranes peck at the ground. On a meadow, Dave Baker takes a metal tool out of the back of his pickup. His black and white sheepdog sits up. In a meadow, a couple of pale brown deer stand still. A rabbit nibbles a plant. We have a great deal of wildlife on the ranch, and we enjoy that. We like that. Dave tightens a barbed wire fence. I'll grumble because the deer are hard on the fences or whatnot, but that's all right. Snow-dusted peaks, forested slopes, and valleys speckled with snow. High above the valley, Great Basin National Park will continue to protect the essence of this country. Through a forest, water gushes along a stream. From its most vulnerable creatures. In a stream, Bonneville cutthroat trout. To its spectacular vistas. A mountainous landscape. It will remain a refuge in which to expand one's sense of space and time. A night sky punctured by a multitude of stars. What I want people to know about this country is that it's a wonderful place to go and escape the rest of the world. It's much like it was 100 years ago, and uh, we hope to keep it that way. Over the Great Basin, a blue sky smeared with clouds. Against a black background, white lettering reads, with thanks to Dave Baker, Gene Krejka, Becky Mills, Virginia Sanchez, Dave Sharp, the Duckwater Shoshone Tribe, Baker Ranches, the community of Snake Valley, and the staff of Great Basin National Park. Producer-director, Rory Banyard. Script, Donna Matrazo, Rory Banyard. Project manager for Great Basin National Park, Brandy Roberts. Project advisor, Harpers Ferry Center, Charles Dunkerley. Produced by North Shore Productions Incorporated. Audio description by Audio Description Solutions. The brown, green, and white Arrowhead logo of the National Park Service, 2013.